Thanks for joining us on this edition of Coast Currents. It's my pleasure to have Erica Fielder in the studio with me today. Erica is an interpretive designer. Erica, welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Let's start by telling our audience and myself a little bit about what is interpretive design. Well, first I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> what, me what it means to um, create an interpretive panel. Okay. The first thing I have to think about is here I have a list of complex scientific text for, let's say, to start off with, and nobody wants to read it except the scientist perhaps who wrote it. But the person who's looking at a panel and on vacation or having a recreational moment of relaxation, hiking along a trail and reading a panel isn't going to want to stand and look at a list of factoids. They're going to want to have something that helps them remember what they saw and read and helps them think about something beyond what just the panel says. So my task in writing an interpretive text for an interpretive panel is to create text that uh, provokes thought and conversation with whomever they're with and also um, gets them to think about something personal. Mm -hmm. For example, if I'm writing about a, an acorn woodpecker and the granary tree where they store their acorns, um, I might call that woodpecker um, a thief. I might call that, <laughs> call that granary tree a deposit box like we have at our banks so that people can kind of relate, begin to relate oh. to what that tree is actually for and what it means perhaps to that acorn woodpecker. Okay. It personalizes the text. And I can weave the facts about how many acorns they shove into those little holes they peck in the wood um, by saying something about the type of energy it would take if a human were to do something like that or how many piles, um, how many, how high the pile would be if we took all the acorns out and measured them. So somehow making it very personal so that we can help something, help people visualize something that's just a picture there on the panel. So that's the first thing I need to do and it takes a lot of research and thinking about how to get that in place. And then the next thing is looking at the artwork or the photographs and choosing the right ones that will tell a thousand words because an interpretive panel um, really can only be about 150 words. Mm -hmm. People won't stand, most people won't stand in front of an interpretive panel more than about 43 seconds. There have actually been studies and tests done on that. So, so you really have to condense the information. Right. And then the first thing I do is create e effective artwork or something that people will look at for Visually a while. Eye yeah. Right. And then the, t the title might be a quirky title. Um, and so that'll catch people's eyes. So between the title and the, the visual artwork or photographs, that will tell enough of a story for someone who's jogging by, let's say. Then the next level of people might be the person who stands there and reads just the topic sentences or the subtitles. So <clears throat> I have to think about, um, I, I know I did a panel earlier a couple of years ago on salmon and their role in bringing nutrients in from the ocean. And so that fed the, the redwood forest. And so the subtitle was Salmon in the Trees, which, is, which captures people's right. attention and gets them to read further. And then for those who really are the studious kind, um, panels that say it all in a short text and give people more information or a, a lead in to something they can inquire into further. For example, a website they could go to or some symbol they can remember. Excellent. And who <clears throat> and where, you know, are some of your clients? Well, that is spreading more and more around the globe happily. Okay. Um, I'm working on several projects in Wisconsin right now. I've worked on projects in Oregon, throughout California, 
And I, one of my favorite projects is in American Samoa in the South Pacific, mm. which includes the Samoan language and English. And <clears throat> some of my panels in the US, especially in California, include Spanish and English. Great. And could you go into a little bit more detail and, and, and about the process and the research, obviously, that has to um, be undertaken when you come up with a, a, a subject matter and a panel? Could you explain to me? Yeah. The well, there are two levels of research. There's the research on the text, and that is very complex because, first of all, we may never visit the site we interpret. Often the budget doesn't include a visit. So we have to get, and I say we, my co-writer my co and my text writer and I, um, need to get a sense of where exactly these panels are going to go. So we ask the client to take photographs from each site. Mm -hmm. um, they may not even know where their sites are going to be along a trail. And we have to get a, a big enough sense of the project, the features there, the plants and animals, the geology, the stars, the moon, whatever is there affecting this site enough so that we can start to write about it and ask them to get photographs and then suggest places along the, the trail that might be of interest to their, their clients. And we always look for the most eye-popping, most interesting spots or the quirkiest spots or the most underinterpreted or, or undervalued spots. Right. So that um, so that we begin to build a, a library of possibilities, and then we have to drill a little deeper and get um, maybe we get quotes from locals about a site, or we get a poem, or we get more text, and after a while we begin to get a picture, and I begin to get images <clears throat> and ideas about um, artwork because mm -hmm. my skill is artwork. Um, pastels and watercolors and those all have to be researched as the second level of research. I have to know, for example, if I do something on um, Patwin basket making in Napa County that I have to know the weave that might be used or I have to have a sense of the images so that if I do a painting of hands weaving a basket I have the proper imagery or if I have, uh, um, for example, in the uh, botanical gardens, Mendocino Coast Botanical Gardens, mm -hmm. I had to get bring in the Audubon Society to give me the final okay on every bird because they're the ones that know how many tail feathers a black a, a red-winged <laughs> blackbird has, and how many how a a robin's bill turns down just so on the upper mandible so that it is a robin's bill and not somebody else's bill. Lo and behold, you should put the wrong bill on it. I know, right. and they would know Thank if anybody they does. Do. Yeah, that they do. You get it right. Yeah, it it does. Now you mentioned the uh, Mendocino Coast Botanical Gardens. Where else are your designs being utilized in Mendocino County? Well, I have some um, in Otis Johnson Park, right here in Fort Bragg. They've just been installed. Mm -hmm. There are a number of them along the River Hall Road to interpret both the logging and the natural features there, and the quarry. This interpretive design and, and the panels really give you an opportunity to merge, obviously, two skill sets that you have, and that's one of the, the scientific background mm -hmm. and the artistic background, mm -hmm. and then that's merge right. them both. And that transposes to something a little bit that we uh, you were involved, weren't you, in, the, in an eco-friendly movement? Oh. Uh, I think you're referring to the eco-art movement, right. ecological art movement. Um, this is a worldwide movement that started with one panel discussion in 1999 about eco-art. What is it? It was the first definition that we tried to grapple with. And we've come up with a definition that is basically eco-art is the merging of the arts and sciences to convey ecological principles to the general public. And eco-artists are people who create large, let's say, I'll give an example, Jackie Bruckner in New York City 
does large um, fountain and water installations that include native plants. So, and basically cleanse water with native plants. There's a woman, um, Betsy Damon, who is doing that, who is part of this group, doing that in China as well, where she created a, a water system that pulled water out of a very polluted river, surrounded by a city of many millions of people. Mm -hmm. And she was able to create clean water at the end of her water sculpture that children could play in. Wow. So she was taking, she formed the waterway in such a way that it created lots of possibility for aeration. There were lots of little things that this water had to tumble over and little concrete elements. And the water was channeled through concrete channels that were in some ways would pool and filled with all kinds of plants that were that held on to bacteria, all kinds of little organisms that would gobble up the nutrients and filter out the pollutants. And eventually the water ended up in a pool that people could splash around in oh, and enjoy. Amazing. Thank you so much, Erica, for joining us and giving us a little bit of information about this fascinating subject. And remember, audience, when you're out and about and walking and you uh, stop or look at one of these panels and learn a lot more about the environment that you are experiencing. And hopefully you'll come and experience Coast Currents again next month. Bye-bye.